But I'd like to welcome everyone to our weekly Marku lecture series. Um, today, I'm going to introduce uh, Paul Krebs, who's with us. Uh, we were very lucky that Paul really wanted to move to San Diego and kept telling Neil and people that he met at <laughs> meetings. And when we were waiting to find a job that would fit for him, and, uh, and uh, we were lucky that we were able to find one at the VA and get him here. I think you'll be very interested in his talk today on his smoking cessation work. But he received his PhD in clinical psychology at Rhode Island University, at University of Rhode Island. I can take my seat there. Uh, Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's like a lot of all the seats. <laughs> but I want that one. <laughs> <laughs> he was a T32 fellow at Sloan Kettering in psycho oncology and did his internship at the New York VA, where he stayed on as a staff psychologist working in PCMHI, behavioral medicine kinds of activities and also did a lot of uh, teaching and research. He did a career development award at the New York VA and transitioned that into a merit uh, grant, which he's bringing with us to our VA to work on here. Um, uh, he's involved in a number of other uh, projects and grants on smoking cessation um, with patients uh, in oncology patients and as well as mental, patients with mental illness. Uh, he uses a lot of technology. Text messaging, I think, is in the merit grant, and but has done 3D games to teach people coping skills for smoking and uh, apps. There's an app for that. E-health, M-health. I'm not sure what the difference between E-health, M-health, and digital health is. We're going for M these days. <laughs> We're going for M-health these days. But um, it's all in the men, uh, mental health technology space, too, which is something I'm very interested in. So I'm, Really looking forward to his talk today, and I'll let you take it away. All right. Um, your mic, so I guess I'm ready to go. All right. Well, thanks for the opportunity and coming out on Monday afternoon here to uh, hear about what I've been up to. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today um, about uh, myself a little bit, uh, where I've gotten to this spot. I'm going to go over some studies uh, that I've been doing, and not all of the studies I've been up to, but I'm kind of bringing them together in this sort of theme of uh, population-based uh, uh, work. Uh, and then I'm going to sort of talk about uh, how that has led to the next steps uh, and what I'd like to sort of continue on uh, here and into the future. Stop me as I go along as well. I'm not just here to just talk at you. So if you have a question, just let me know. Um, so, this is sort of where I've been. I've been in East Coast through my whole life. This is my first two weeks in the West Coast, so it's quite a bit different. So I started out in this lovely, not so lovely place, called uh, Coal Township, literally the name of the town, uh, in Pennsylvania <laughs> over here, and that is what it looked like. Um, and then I moved all the way up to Scranton for uh, undergrad at the University of Scranton. It was a little Jesuit school, uh, which was uh, quite amazing, actually. Um, and uh, it's funny to, to watch the office because there's like trees that don't grow in Scranton very clearly in the show. I'm like, that is not in Scranton. Uh, it's definitely LA. Um, and then all the way to Rhode Island, uh, it's Narragansett where the University of Rhode Island is, uh, which was uh, marvelous. And while I was there, just a little bit of sort of what I was up to, uh, I was in the Cancer Prevention Research Center uh, with uh, Jim Prochaska and the folks there. Um, doing my graduate work, and then I worked at the Brown Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies on a couple studies up there. So uh, Rhode Island is it's nice, a small state, so you get the round uh, all within 45 minutes. Uh, and then uh, we moved to uh, New York for my clinical internship at the Brooklyn VA, uh, New York Harbor. Um, and uh, most recently, I was living in Sunnyside, uh, which is a little, our neighborhood in Queens. So I started out in Brooklyn. After internships, I went uh, Sloan Kettering for the T32. And then I've been at uh, Manhattan VA and NYU School of Medicine since then, um, and uh, really enjoying it. So uh, a little bit of what I was up to at all those places more specifically. Um, you or I, I was, uh, came in, and we were doing uh, computerized population programs for three cancer risks. Uh, there was two studies. There was a parent study and a, and a, and a, and a kid study. So I got to work on that. Um, and uh, multiple behavior change interventions, uh, which was a fun project funded by uh, Robert Wood Johnson. Um, and then at Brown, I was doing family motivational interviews for uh, alcohol uh, uh, positive teens in the ER, which was 
challenging. I had to sit in the ER from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Uh, weekend nights, great when you're 25. Um, <laughs> but it was a really great study to be a part of, a very intensive motivational interviewing training, um, and uh, a nice group of people to work with. And I moved on to a clinical internship at the VA, which was a, a fantastic. We worked in psycho-oncology, palliative care, and pain, um, which is uh, not necessarily traditional for a psychologist, but it's really what I wanted to be doing. Uh, and then turned that into a postdoctoral position at Sloan Kettering. Uh, I was part of their T32 program, um, and uh, mainly doing tobacco uh, in cancer populations. And then uh, by the time I got done with that, I had an RO3, which I brought to uh, NYU. And that was uh, an interactive e-health program for exercise and um, healthy eating in uh, cancer survivors. So I uh, finally got that published. <laughs> so I guess you could say I'm look, doing a couple things that sort of bring this story together with uh, both methods and then uh, uh, focus of sort of content. The methods that I sort of focus on are uh, population and health services, um, health communication, mHealth, uh, and sort of the topics uh, mainly have been tobacco, uh, but then the sort of cancer treatment and survivorship have been uh, a population of interest of mine as well. So bringing this together in terms of proactive care, which is sort of where my studies have, have uh, focused on, um, what is proactive care versus sort of reactive care? Um, reactive care would be sort of the traditional norm. Um, patients receive care when they're sort of purposely referred to um, from their uh, health care provider, right? So just sort of wait around for the, until the patients come to you, basically. That's sort of the model. The proactive model um, is a sort of population-based strategy where you sort of mine the, the record, which this, uh, the records have made this possible. Um, so you find your at-risk patients and you do some sort of strategy to identify and intervene with them. Um, and that can be sort of opt-in, uh, where you say, would you like to, I've identified you as a smoker who has diabetes, would you like to be part of our study or just treatment? Um, that's opt-in, or there's opt-out, which I'm doing more of, uh, whereas um, sort of you're enrolled in this unless you tell us, no, you don't want to be. Um, so we're sort of investigating both of those methods. <coughs> Um, so why would we bother to do this? Uh, for actually quite a few reasons. Um, it fulfills meaningful use criteria. Um, it decreases provider burden and barriers, as we've seen in some of our other studies. Um, you know, it's, it's gone from five days to three days. It, it's asking less and less and less and less, of especially primary care, because they uh, have to do a lot. So if we sort of take that burden away, that's a benefit. If you take patient burden, too, if you say, Oh, you know, call this clinic, show up at this group. Well, that's, you know, I, I, I used to sit in this, the tobacco association group in New York, and it usually was me checking my email for an hour um, all by myself. So, you know, that's, uh, if uh, we can come to them versus uh, having them come to us, uh, clearly they don't necessarily want to be coming to us <laughs> for that. Um, it enables panel management. Here's my patients for these criteria. Boom. All right, there they are. Uh, it's sufficient and consistent. So um, I can have 20 providers doing a so-so job of tobacco, or I can have two providers doing a pretty good job at it. Um, and in terms of uh, research part of it, um, the consent part can be uh, you know, more efficient as well. Uh, sometimes if I'm doing the opt-out studies, or opt-out opt studies, um, we just sort of go get rid of the consent process altogether. Um, uh, for the intervention part of it, not for the data gathering part of it, uh, which eliminates a lot of sort of disparities in who uh, consents and who doesn't consent. And obviously, uh, impact. Um, if I reach a lot of people, even with a little intervention, that increases the population impact of that intervention. So a bit of context about sort of the proactive care. Um, even though you might be able to do the same intervention, the research is showing that just doing proactive care is actually more effective. Um, there's sort of a review of uh, telephone counseling. Um, they didn't necessarily randomize with active versus passive recruitment approaches, but they did find uh, proactive uh, methods were um, more effective. Um, so the data is sort of showing that. These are other people's studies. I'll go into sort of the studies that we've been doing that sort of show a similar story. Um, so this is the first study I did when I was 
uh, brought on board, um, I just sort of like, here's the data, make sense of this. That was my goal. Uh, this study was an opt-out study done here in California, 35 PA sites, uh, by uh, Scott Sherman. Um, and uh, then I started working on it. So this was a very interesting uh, project because it was sort of a study one and a study two, proactive versus reactive. And uh, they were randomized by week. Sometimes the week got proactive care, and sometimes the week got reactive care. So in study one, um, the intervention was cessation from the California quit line. And in study two, the uh, intervention was self-help materials only. And uh, at least in this condition, study one, just using proactive care was more effective on quitting than uh, reactive care alone, and, and the same thing for medication. Study two, self-help wasn't as good, uh, no effect, but medication increased. Um, just same intervention, just the um, uh, outreach changed from proactive to reactive. So uh, the next one, um, I was a research uh, uh, counseling supervisor on um, a co-investigator. Um, this was uh, a huge study. Uh, we had uh, approached 18,000 participants uh, across Bellevue and the VA. Um, so this was a study where we used the EHR to identify every hospitalized smoker over a period of three, four years, um, including Hurricane Sandy, which shut down the medical center for six months. Uh, that was really fun. Uh, <laughs> so we approached every single smoker, we think, um, who was an inpatient and went through the ER. So they were randomized to our uh, counseling from our staff versus the state quit line. What did we find? So our six month quit was quite a bit better. Uh, the one that we did versus the state quit line. The state quit line in New York only provides two sessions. We were giving up to seven, uh, as well as more intensive medication. Uh, coordination. So that was that one. And then um, at the VA, this is a project that I wrote. Uh, it became a merit award. Um, we had been doing telephone cessation there, and the problem with, I was saying earlier, one of our, our studies was um, provider referral. Our providers, our mental health providers, were not referring patients to our study. Uh, we had some who were really good at it, and some who were like, eh, not so much. Uh, so that was a big problem. They were sort of that too busy point, right? They were just too busy, uh, not really on their mind, uh, or didn't think it was their job necessarily. So we took them out of it, and we said, well, we, we can recruit the smokers without the providers. Let's just ask the data. So we found, um, uh, used uh, Vinci, and we identified 20,000 mental health patients at four VA hospitals, used in Minneapolis, uh, Tampa, and uh, New York. Um, this was an opt-in study, um, and then uh, after we sent them the letter, we got the back, and we randomized them to the uh, usual care, the VA, whatever that might have been at their site, or uh, the proactive telephone treatment. And once we got their consent back, we called them and said, hey, do you want to be part of our uh, tobacco cessation intervention? We'll give you some calls and provide you some support and coordinate your medication. Um, they got 12 sessions over six months. So uh, results were uh, evidence of that it was actually more helpful than uh, usual care at 12 months um, on both uh, seven day and uh, prolonged abstinence. Um, now this one uh, leads into my uh, merit, which we'll be doing here hopefully very soon, uh, which is this, we're calling it, um, but sorry, uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, it also led into um, this project, which is uh, I'm the PI on. I will be finishing this in September. Um, this is a award through the CDC. Proactive methods again. There was an RFA. Can we use the cancer registry to identify patients uh, who are smokers? Not just the EHR, but the cancer registry, which is sort of a step removed. Um, so uh, this, we're looking at um, recruiting 600 smokers. This is an opt-out study. So all these smokers that we identify are in the study until they tell us no. Um, not that many have, thankfully. 
Uh, and we're doing this at three hospitals, which is also fascinating, Bellevue, NYU, and the VA. So com three completely different systems. Um, and uh, we're, uh, because um, the mail um, is the first point of contact, we're randomizing that to various conditions as well. So we're doing a two by two study um, comparing mail versus care coordination and loss in game framed uh, messaging. So results on smoking, we don't know yet because our last data collection point is going to be in October. Well, could you explain that? I the next slide will we'll, we'll explain that a little bit more, the framing. Uh, but the main point of this is the CDC wanted to see, can we use our cancer registries for something other than sort of sitting around and being data collection instruments? Can we actually use them for uh, intervention purposes? So a big point of this is the feasibility of it. I'll get into some of that later. Um, and uh, are patients willing to be contacted maybe up to two years after they're done with treatment? Um, because not all of these are primary care settings, especially uh, NYU Cancer Center. Once they're done, they're done. They ain't come back, uh, which is different from Bellevue and the VA, which where they continue to get care there. So this is an example of our gain and loss framing. Right? So this is the first point of contact. Uh, my name is so-and-so, et cetera. Um, this is the gain-framed messaging, right? So you see, uh, reduces risk of cancer progression, uh, reduces risk of cancer coming back, increases survival, very happy, the happy people are happy. So we both framed the messaging in terms of the words and the messaging in terms of the pictures. So if you want to get a loss-framed message, you'll get this. So smoking increases your risk. It's exactly the opposite, but with loss framing. And then the people are like sad too. Um, so very similar pictures, guy, guy, woman, woman, and then if the framing is different. <coughs> so uh, we're uh, going to see if that has any effect on the response rate. Because when you're doing this proactive care, this is your point of contact. So you have to be very uh, thoughtful about how you're actually going to present the data, present this, hey, how are you doing? Uh, uh, either where it's a text or this is, in this case, it's up in the mail. Let's see. Um, similar methods. This is my CDA. I thought I'd just throw that in here, too, since I'm finishing it. Um, we are, um, I was a small pilot of, uh, again, cancer patients, uh, newly diagnosed cancer patients at the VA. And what we did, we randomized them to sort of standard care, or standard, better than standard care, which was a nurse intervention and the connection to the quit line. Uh, we actually went online and put their name in to the New York State quit line so that we got a proactive call back, which is a little better than standard care, um, or standard care plus risk feedback. And I'll show you that in a second. Results pending in October. We sort of just recruited our last participant this week. Um, so I had to wait six months on that one. Um, so this is what I created um, with uh, my colleague Angie McFiglin in uh, Michigan. Um, these uh, decision guides is sort of coming out of that framework of decision making. Uh, and we sent this tailored to their particular cancer. Um, so this is what we created based on data. Um, check this out. Out of 100 men, if you had prostate cancer, you got this one. 34 who kept smoking would have cancer back. 19 who quit would have cancer come back. So we actually present them the, the actual sort of data there. Um, we did this for colorectal, prostate, lung, head, and neck. And uh, sort of the last page, we also did this too for use of treatment. So using treatment is more effective than trying to go it alone. Sort of presented that very, very clearly. So we're going to see if that's actually more effective at getting people A, to use the quit line, and B, to quit, versus just sort of the very quick uh, provider-led intervention. We will see. Um, Research ten teaches you to be very um, uh, patient <laughs> uh, and waiting to get your data. Um, looking at proactive methods again, we did this as a uh, preparatory to a PO1 submission. Um, we said, well, we have all this data on smokers. What's the least touch that we can do to maybe enroll them in the state quit line? And maybe we can just send them all a text message if you want to get connected, you hit one. If you don't, hit two, and we're done with you. So that's what we did. 
Um, we found 4,000 smokers with that patient visit um, at uh, NYU, Bellevue, and Montefiore. NYU and Bellevue are kind of the same thing. Um, this is an opt-out design. Um, they're going to get the messages until they tell us to stop. Leave us, leave, leave us alone, please. Um, and again, we did some message framing. Again, this is the first point of, and only point of contact with us. So let's experiment with some of that messaging. Um, and then the outcomes were, weren't quitting. They were just sort of response rate to this message if, if they wanted to get connected to the quit line or not. So just an example of some of our messaging. We, we looked at uh, some, a couple of theories. Um, and uh, sort of we wanted to look at sort of self-efficacy, response efficacy, um, and some uh, risk feedback. Um, so uh, we focus grouped these with five focus groups at Bellevue and uh, Montefiore. Uh, and they came uh, out that they liked this message first. Hey, this is Bellevue or Montefiore. We're offering a new text service to help people quit smoking. Standard text rates reapply. Text stop to cancel. If they didn't text stop, they kept going. Um, the next message the next day, they got, it's Bellevue again. Quitting smoking is hard, but you can do it. Self-efficacy message. Um, some of them got call to action. Um, text one to connect. Do it now. Um, and uh, some of them didn't get that. Uh, they didn't get to do it now. Right? Um, and if uh, they didn't respond a month later, we texted them again. So what did we find? Um, well, a big part of it was who responded. So um, you know, we'd look at the feasibility of this. I got 4,000 smokers. What's going to happen? So uh, we let, mailed them letters to give them opportunity to opt out. Uh, our, our provider found that 1,400 supposed cell numbers were not real cell numbers. Mm -hmm. So they're out. Um, so we sent that introduction text to 2,300 people. Um, 250 immediately replied stop, which isn't too bad, right? It's like 10%. Um, and then uh, intervention texts went out to like uh, about 2,000 smokers out of that 4,000. Uh, immediately 105 texted connect, and then it went down to 50, 37, 13, so decreasing returns. Um, and, uh, you know, um, not a whole lot of stops. I think it was, let's summarize it here. Um, 10% overall responded with a quit line request. About 24% said stop, and most people just ignored us. Um, and what do we find with this message framing? Um, well, all that fancy stuff really didn't make a whole lot of a difference. So we could add all this stuff up, threats and self-efficacy, and yes, no, and response efficacy, and norms, everyone's doing it. Everyone's, it really didn't make it a whole lot of difference. What did make a difference was People didn't like the response efficacy message. Do it now. The quit line is more effective. That was very clearly they didn't like that. So if we just simple self-efficacy message was just fine. It was no different than adding all that stuff in, um, which will inform one of the projects I'm uh, planning to do. So keeping that in mind. So there's some benefits. Uh, to these methods, clearly. But then there's also some problems. And the problems really inform future work, right? So let's look at the problems. Um, data accuracy. This is most apparent in the process study in the cancer centers, but they're using the registry, right? Got registry data. It's six months old by the time it gets in the registry because someone has to sit in a dark room and type it in. Um, is that good enough to do an intervention with? Are the people still alive? Um, are they still smokers? We don't know. So what we had to do was look at that registry data and uh, have one of our wonderful interns do a chart review. Um, and we're writing a paper from this. We just submitted it. Um, looking at the accuracy of the cancer registry data with more current health record data. So what we found here, the registry said they're a current smoker. What did the most recent uh, health record say? At Bellevue, it was pretty good. And where you was less good, and the viewer was even less good. Uh, for former smoker, and then never smoker, W really was really bad about that. NYU was a whole lot better, and the VA was sort of on par. And then they're all really bad with categorizing never smokers. So, 
that was quite telling um, because we did have people respond to us because again it was an opt out study. Hey, my husband's like right in the right, my husband is dead. You know, stop bothering me, right? You know, we had a couple of those. Um, so it's important to see if you know the data is good enough to actually do an intervention with because you have no other point of contact. Um, so predictive value is about 72%, which is on par with sort of another study in the lung cancer world that did this. Not quite probably good enough to do care with, probably, in terms of accuracy, because people get mad at you. Uh, similar with data accuracy, our chart study, those 18,000 patients we approached in the bedside, well, uh, yeah. So the EHR at Bellevue said that they were smokers, but when we actually went to the bedside, 17% said they weren't. So somewhere something got mistranslated. Um, as well as 21% in this population had no US phone number. So they might have been a smoker in the record, but then we couldn't contact them because they didn't have a phone number. Remember, this is Bellevue, which is sort of the public, the public hospital of New York City. Um, so it's a largely sort of immigrant at risk population. And they don't want to give their send the phone numbers out, nor do they want to give their addresses out and many times. So 21% is quite high. In um, our test connect study, again, you know, 38% invalid cell numbers as well. So kind of similar in terms of working with that population at Bellevue. And then obviously, data accuracy is the question, right? This data gets into the EHR via some provider asking, are you a smoker in some better or worse way, right? So if I ask you, you know, Eric, are you a smoker? <laughs> have you used, had any tobacco product in the past 30 days? No. It's quite a bit different, right? Um, <laughs> very few are trained in actually how to assess it behaviorally, or have you used any tobacco product in the past 30 days, versus are you a smoker, which could mean anything. If you've seen the recent campaigns, you know, you're a smoker if you smoke one, right? I've seen that around California uh, recently in the past two weeks. Um, so depending on how it's asked, I know the VA doesn't ask it behaviorally. They just sort of had this very kind of not particularly useful uh, word, uh, sentence. So it's not asked behaviorally. So people who smoke one, two, three, I'm not a smoker, but they're using tobacco. Um, so they would say no, but they're still using tobacco. In California, they'll say smoke what? And that as well, right? Are you a smoker? Well, what does that mean, right? So, you know. <laughs> so this is a this is a big <laughs> barrier as well. You know, you don't have good data. How you do an intervention? Because you're not there in person to like verify that. So and there's also sort of institutional and, and provider uh, barriers as well to doing this. Our first process study at NYU took nine months to get through the RB because we were the first study at NYU using proactive methods, and they're like, what? Um, so that was a fight uh, that we had to address, um, that we weren't harming them just because we were offering them treatment. Uh, many opportunities to opt out, um, as well as for the provider role, Does, do providers have, are they open to someone sort of coming around from the outside and working with their patients on tobacco or whatever else it may be as well? Um, and what's my role and, you know, um, sort of territoriality of it? Some people are grateful and some people are more territorial. Um, and then response rates. Again, if we're using opt-out designs, no one has consented them. They have no other prior contact with the study to sort of build loyalty. I, I, I was at the OBSSR Summer Science Institute where I was trapped in Virginia for two weeks. And uh, one of the presentations was this researcher. She had like a, a, a research consent party uh, it was quite fascinating where they would like bring the participants in, they would get them involved in this, this is why you need to respond to the surveys and here's some cookies and they really got them involved and their response rates were like 90% at a year, you know, uh, because they did all that work up front to get them involved in the study and so that they understood why it's important to respond to the surveys. We do none of that. We don't even consent them up front for these opt-out designs until they start, um, we consent them when they have to do a survey. So the first point of contact was like six months later, would you do this survey? And then we can send them because that's research. 
so the response rates are going to be variable. These are studies that are sort of underway. Um, and uh, we, we don't know where that's going to be. Uh, and these were the opt-in studies, and their sort of more sort of traditional chart was, you know, I think uh, uh, reflective of the population. So here we have um, another example of that um, uh, for this process study in the cancer patients at the registry. Um, you can see it, it varies by population as well. We got the VA, you know, responding to our surveys a good 50% of the time because they're, they tend to be nice, you know, involved uh, research participants. But NYU and Bellevue is, you know, sometimes a little more than half that. Um, because like, why are you contacting me? We don't really have a long-term investment in, uh, in the hospital system. So, uh, we're having a harder time contacting them at, for our six month and 12 month outcomes. Because again, we didn't consent them up front. This is the first time they're basically hearing from us about doing a survey. I have a question. Um, do, what, what are the data of, of, um, in general for how many smokers, oh, sorry. What's the data for how many smokers want to quit? Like is, <coughs> You know, so basically, you know, is it because are they not responding because they don't want to quit, or so, because they don't want to respond the, in this way? Right. Well, what's the like? You know, seventy percent are in sort of you know contemplation or uh, preparation or action, and like sort of like twenty to thirty percent are like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I don't want to be. Uh, so that's kind of like many it's sort of where everything sort of lies is most throw a dart, and most people want to say they quit at some point, um, but getting them along to actually taking steps um, is more difficult. I've done it before. I've heard that a lot at focus groups. I did this a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah, I've quit many times before. I'm just frustrated at this point. And I don't want to engage now. I do want to, but I'm just tired. So that, that, that was a huge response, too. Or I don't think I can anymore. Um, speaking of patient beliefs, um, these are recent quotes from focus groups I was doing for the for the VA project, um, uh, my smoking doesn't have anything to do with my prostate cancer. So some misbeliefs about the relationship. They, everyone thinks it's just lung cancer, and it's really not. Um, I'm not a talking kind of person. So our interventions are mainly on the phone, or, 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 you know, counseling. Um, yeah, I don't talk about it. OK, that was a very short interview, by the way. <laughs> um, Best way to do it is on your own. You've all heard that before. That's a very popular uh, thing with our, our folks here. Um, we also did the chart study in three languages, English, Chinese, and um, Spanish. And our poor counselor, who uh, was our Chinese counselor, he had like two participants in four years. Because uh, that population is very, I will do it alone. Um, there's very cultural differences around that, too. Um, and then uh, no energy. I don't want to mention anything else. So, doing a population study like this, you don't have necessarily the opportunity to, you know, deal with these barriers in person as you would sort of one on one. If you're just sending them a letter in the mail, they're sort of left to sit with this uh, prior release. So that can be a negative. So that's also informing some of this work that I'm doing with this current VA study, uh, texting them some, uh, you know. Contrary messages beforehand to uh, sort of maybe you know uh, mitigate some of these. How often do you contact them? Well, there's lots of options here in terms of outreach, intervention, treatment duration are all different variables you can play with. And I put all this together. Um, these are the studies that I've worked on and a couple others as well, just to sort of show the variation um, and what people have been up to. Uh, most times, it's one outreach. You might get five calls, but it's sort of one attempt in general, right? Um, except this, um, our uh, cancer registry study, we're outreaching them every three months. So regardless of whether you heard from us the first time or next time, you're all getting phone calls every three months uh, to try to re-engage them. Um, but I found this quite interesting. I didn't necessarily realize this as much until I put this together. It's all just one outreach attempt. You're not really reaching them at any other point in time where their motivation may have changed or something like that. And this is the only study that we sort of were doing that. 
um, as well as the texting setting. Because it was just so easy, you could just send them a text again. Um, intervention is sort of varying over time. Uh, folks are working on uh, more longitudinal studies now to um, extend the treatment period. Um, and that's sort of paying some benefits as well, or sort of going towards that end. Um, in terms of extending treatment to, to half a year to a year, um, et cetera. Um, and then with what? Have you seen, remember, remember the Martians and they, the, from the Muppets, they deliver and they, they come down on the, on the phone and they don't know what the phone is? Um, a lot of our population is for the like that now. When the phone rings, it's like, what, what is it doing? What's it ringing for? Mm -hmm. Who's calling me? Um, <laughs> Telemarketed at this point, right? No one answers the phone. Um, even if it's your relative or whatever, no one answers the phone anymore. Um, if what we're offering is telephone interventions and nobody answers the phone, I think it's like, whoa, what's the phone? What is this thing ringing? That's a big problem. Um, so, uh, looking forward, um, this is a study I hope we'll be starting here. Um, we're trying to intervene at two levels. And this is coming from the uh, proactive uh, study of mental health where we um, you know, had a good response rate, et cetera, but it wasn't quite ideal. Our counselors were having a awful time getting people on the phone because no one answers the phone, especially when it says US government or a blocked number. Uh, we quickly found out we had to call them from NYU phones, which you know, depending on just said the phone number or NYU, right? That was much less scary than the US government. Um, but still, our counselors were spending a lot of time trying to get people on the phone. Like six, and seven, we stopped eight times trying to get them for a telephone session, right? Huge time effort. And not necessarily practical outside of the study. So what we're doing here is we're randomizing them to two different things, where they text to engage and then text to um, uh, uh, retain. So our text to engage is going to be um, randomized to texting um, eight texts over two weeks in one group. Like we said, to counter some of those patient beliefs, NRT isn't effective, I can do it on my own, I don't want to talk to anybody. So we're going to do eight texts to sort of counter some of those very common beliefs that we found in our formative work. Uh, or our usual condition where we just sort of cold call them after they sign consent. Um, the people who do enroll will get randomized again to our usual um, efficacious telephone intervention, um, or they will get that plus text messaging. And this is, I've been just working out this protocol uh, recently with the folks at Annie, uh, which is the VA Office of Connected Care, um, who provide this text messaging service, uh, working on the protocol for that. So they're going to get a text message every day that they're in the program, just a very general message. And they're also going to get a uh, personalized message that comes from the counselor, well, supposedly comes from the counselor, um, that summarizes what they talked about that week. So hopefully this will um, enhance the treatment and also sort of remind them, hey, we're in this program. I don't think, especially for some of these populations, we're sort of finding once a week or once every two week phone call probably isn't enough um, to remind them and keep them engaged. Our, our focus groups really say, text me every day. I want to be reminded of this every single day. Text me twice a day. And which is actually contrary to what I had thought. I thought, oh, we're going to bother them. And they don't tell us that. They very have clearly said, we want to be reminded of this more often. Like, OK. Um, let's try it out and see if they really do want it when I actually have to get them every day. Um, and uh, and see if it's actually more effective than just calling them. So that's what we're doing. Uh, we're almost ready to start this in New York. Uh, we identified our patients. We got the data out of Vinci. Uh, we're programming any like right now to actually make this work. Hopefully soon here. Um, this is another study we uh, I'm a co-investigator on. Similar. Um, another opt out study. An opt out study at the VA. We got it approved by the central IRB two weeks ago. Um, where we're actually not consenting them before they're quote unquote in the study. Um, this is for smokers who are getting uh, low dose uh, CTs for lung cancer screening. 
what we're doing is automating the process of them getting a call from the VA quit line. So um, I was involved in this study for like three years now. We did a VA pilot and then we turned it into this. Um, and I created this with the, the uh, intervention actually. Um, so what we're doing here, um, every time one of our study sites, which will hopefully be here, we talked to the pulmonary service here and they're interested in doing it, um, Providence and the uh, New York. Every time someone orders a CT from those sites for lung cancer screening, they're automatically get referred to the VA quit line. They're going to get two phone calls to talk about um, any questions they have about uh, low-dose CT with regard to tobacco because the evidence shows that if they get a all clear on their CT, they're like, hey, get smoking. So this is specifically designed to counter that. Um, and then we're going to look at, uh, at quitting at 12 months. So that's that's an ongoing uh, study we have. Um, and uh, I'm going to hopefully be training the, the quit line counselors um, around uh, issues related to uh, lung cancer screening. Because this is our pilot findings, um, we did uh, find a really strong effect. It was a small pilot, but um, you know, without any support, um, you know, 11 percent uh, participated in any kind of uh, intervention, but 44 percent. This is only two phone calls, so it, it really uh, had a, a dramatic increase in even abstinence. Uh, Seven versus 19 percent use of the VA quit line. Five percent versus 15 percent confidence in quitting. Um, and motivation. So it was actually pretty effective. That's why we got the larger project, probably. Um, and it's also in the context of the SCALE collaborative at NCI. Um, there's uh, six studies uh, that were funded to do tobacco cessation and uh, uh, lung cancer screening. Um, we were invited in because we just happened to get funded at the same time. Um, and uh, we're part of the SCALE collaborative. We're the only study, though, who is using a proactive method, opt-out design. So I was at the collaborative meeting a few months ago, and they were all talking about baseline. I'm like, well, again, we don't have to deal with well, how we're having problems with uh, consent and finding participants. And they were like, we were the VA or the corner. We're like, mm, we don't have to do that because we just found our participants in the in the in the um, in the record. They're coming to us as part of everyday care. They're just coming to us. We don't have to consent them. We don't have to find them. We don't have to do any of that. Our problem is going to be at 6 and 12 months, we actually have to consent them for research, which is the data collection. So we just sort of have different problems. Um, but uh, we will be learning from this collaborative here. Uh, and also, I can't uh, talk about this without mentioning sort of the apps and EHRs and how that's sort of be going to be changing this communication pattern if you can flow data right in. Uh, to your uh, record and as well, um, you know what, what does that mean for proactive care uh, when it could sort of come on your phone? I was at this uh, M Health meeting two weeks ago, and uh, they were sort of like, "Well, when your house, when your nest senses that you're smoking, what can that do?" You know, there was like this was the big, very broad thinkers at this meeting, right? So is that proactive care too? Uh, your nest senses that it's a cigarette. Uh, and that tells your Nest app, uh, are you smoking? And then that feeds us all the way through, right? It suggests a smoking cessation intervention if your Nest detects that you're smoking, right? Just thinking of it all the way through. Um, and uh, I did this survey of uh, and help app use a few, uh, two years ago now. Um, and uh, people are pretty open, you know, 20%, whoever used a health app uh, wanted to talk with their doctor and uh, use a smoking. Uh, app or uh, help to stop a habit. So the openness to it is pretty high. This is anybody who's ever used a health app, 20% said, yeah, hey, I do that. Um, so uh, some planned things I have in the works. Um, this is a really fun one. I mentioned this to folks earlier today. Uh, this is going to be an R21 resubmission, hopefully, um, as soon as I can do it. Um, it's already written and ready to go. Um, we're doing the most design, uh, hopefully, uh, which is a fractional factorial design to look at the effective components of an mHealth app. It wasn't just, oh, we'll create this app, and if the app isn't effective or not, that doesn't really give us a whole lot of data. 
But if we look at the effective components of it and break it down, that will hopefully give us more information. What are the options here? Like we can give um, uh, feedback and assess daily tobacco use. It's an option, yeah, but is it effective? We don't know. Um, we can pair them with a buddy, and maybe that, that was been an option. Um, we can um, provide little games, and that's an option. Um, and then, um, uh, what was the other one? But, um, so we're breaking down all these various things that you can do in an app uh, and looking at the main effects of those. Um, uh, which is based on a sort of pilot that we did. We created this app already uh, with a grant from the Eurasia Foundation. So um, people liked it. Uh, they were very enthusiastic about it. And this is sort of the uh, adult version of that small pilot grant uh, is to look at the effective components of it and break it down. Um, and the second one is going to be an R01, or is an R01 I already wrote for that P submission, which was the uh, text messaging um, program at Bellevue, we sent those 4,000 text messages. Uh, this was my project that I wrote for it, uh, proactive trial of text messaging and longitudinal care for smokers with mental health and substance use diagnoses. Uh, we were seeing if um, adding uh, longitudinal care and text messaging would uh, make that intervention more effective. Um, so that is written, um, and I hope to be able to submit that at some point soon. Um, as well. So again, using the very similar methods um, and sort of continuing to target and tailor uh, to bump up the efficacy. And not just efficacy, but also engagement and retention, as that's also important for uh, the efficacy piece. Um, and this is a fun little pilot I got at a Cancer Center. Um, looking at a little other vein of research. Um, going along with the cancer thing, um, people say, oh, well, if I quit smoking after diagnosis, is that helpful or not? And I quickly realized that we didn't really have a lot of data on that. Um, so I got this uh, group together um, at NYU across disciplines, um, and uh, we're going to look at DNA addicts. Um, after people quit smoking. Uh, people who do quit smoking, people don't quit smoking um, after a diagnosis of lung cancer. So this is going to be a pilot in 50 people, hopefully. Um, we just got it through the RV like last week. And um, I sort of had a, gave it to my co-investigator uh, to sort of run. But um, you know, it's a study that I wrote and hopefully will eventually result in uh, a larger project. Uh, once we get the data out of it about a year from now. So it all kind of ties together. Um, and uh, I have to give a shout out to uh, all the team members. This is my intern group uh, last week from my lab uh, who done amazing work uh, on the, all these projects. Um, and uh, our group at MOU and my partner, Brian. That's it. So we have a few minutes for questions. So you started to talk about this a little, but are you looking at like what types of people respond to these different, you know, it seems like you're doing it a little bit, but I would think that would have a big part of it. Like certain types of people just don't want to get a phone message. And certain types of people love to get a phone message. Right. Well, we, 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 uh, we found that there hasn't been any specific difference on who responds and who doesn't. Uh, we haven't found it across gender, age, anything like that, at least in the uh, one proactive study that we were able to look at that. Um, there wasn't a difference in response rate um, for that. The process study, they weren't, we weren't allowed to uh, collect data on people who didn't consent. Um, <laughs> Uh, or, or keep their data. So sometimes you're allowed to do that and sometimes you're not. I really had to argue for that uh, for one study. I think that's very important. Because Arabi said, why, why are you looking at this data? These, these people didn't consent. I'm like, well, this is important. So it's a piece I have actually been very focused on arguing. Um, but those studies, we were able to look at it. We haven't found anything. 
I know that's that's something that's important to, to look at. Do you know, have you done anything where you combine sort of assessment? It sounds like mostly you're sort of pushing things, suggestions to them. Mm -hmm. But are you ever asking them something? So for example, you, when you're saying that you give them the text messages that maybe address some of the patient beliefs, mm -hmm. would it be possible to ask them what their beliefs are and then push messages that are related to that? Right, at the VA, no. <laughs> um, because that becomes research data. You're not allowed to do that in text messaging. Um, very clearly, no. Um, unfortunately not. Um, the uh, other one, which was Bellevue, we also were not allowed to do bidirectional bi texting. Um, so unfortunately not. Uh, I am working on a Fogarty as well uh, in Vietnam, um, which we are integrating some bidirectional. We actually are doing assessments um, uh, real time in the sort of pilot to pilot with 40 participants. Response rate has been dismal. Uh, in Vietnam, we have like 188 supposed, uh, like 10, 10 questions over text message. Our uh, response rate is like 5%. So it is something we did recently try, and the response rate was terrible. Um, in that cultural context, they get a lot of um, ads in their phones and their text messages. Um, and they told us that it's really, really annoying. Um, so in that cultural context, um, it wasn't effective because they get all this spam in their texting. Um, but it is something we did try. And I guess there's no way to get around the collection of research data. I'm just thinking about how Google and other places kind of know what you click on and know what you look at, and then they can tailor what mm -hmm. you get next based on what you have any sort of interaction with or any kind of response to. So you could maybe not save it, but if you if you had some information about whether they had read the text, for example, mm -hmm. um, then you could maybe do right. something different and see if that makes the difference for whether they even read it. Or right. We, we're not able to get that. Our sense of our, our, our texting conversation. We, we, we don't know if they, they read it. There's no way to know, unfortunately. So that's in the opt-out studies, right? Uh, opt in or opt out. If it's an opt in and they sign a consent form, then you can text them and get a response. And because we've done it in the VA, you could also have things native on the phone that don't mm -hmm. go into the internet. So if they answer one way, they get this response. If they answer another way, and then you don't ever see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or just a native app that doesn't go on the right. internet. And but we've done text messaging and apps that do we get collect right, responses, but they have to consent to. Uh, it, send them ahead of time, but in yes. your opt-out studies yes. is where you're running. That's, again, that's sort of the pro and the, the con, right? You, 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 you get around uh, bias and consent, but then you also can't collect data that you want to collect. So sort of like, you have to pick your poison. I've, I've picked the poison of um, uh, not getting that data at the expense of trying to find methods of, of sort of reaching uh, populations. Uh, not necessarily getting into the finer super super details. Um, right. So, you mentioned a little bit about um, pilot data for the young adults, and then which kind of which uh, pieces of the app they mm -hmm. respond best to. Can you say anything? Something we should probably talk more about going forward. But I'm just curious what you can say about. What you found? So yeah, we had uh, 40 participants in the U.S. and 40 in Russia, because that was the, the app. Um, I think 70 uh, percent of them would like to use it again. Um, they actually really did enjoy the buddy component. Uh, we had a craving button, uh, which they could click on when they're having a craving. Um, they really liked that. Um, we were sort of keeping that. Um, that was the other one we were uh, testing on the, with the most design: craving button, no craving button. You know, is it is it actually helpful to interact with the app when you're having a craving versus not. If they're having a craving, they <laughs> click the button, and they get this whole menu of various options uh, that we sort of created, a kind of continual random uh, generation of, of things they could do. They, they could click on hear music, and it would actually literally take them to YouTube. Um, play a game, it would literally take them to a game, uh, not just a suggestion. It would bring them right to something. Um. <laughs>
Are we done with the questions? Okay, so um, um, I want to thank Dr. Krebs for um, his presentation. And I also want to welcome him to the UC San Diego oh. Department of Psychiatry, although Dr. Granholm has jumped the gun. He's hired him already. <laughs> and before we could go through all of our paperwork, and I uh, mean, who knows what's going to happen next. But anyway, you're, you're very um, uh, welcome to join our group. Let's see if that fits. <laughs> all right. Um, you're going to need to wear it. And uh, you can. It's a guy's hat. If your head is too big or it's too small, you can adjust it. Uh, the other thing you should work with Eric on, like I mentioned in our uh, conversation, is uh, get him one of his fancy uh, band-aids to measure cotinine, carbon monoxide, and whatever in real time, mm -hmm. you know, and, and link that to your iPhone, see what you think of it, right? right? So get a student working with him. We should get biosensors. Yeah, that, that has been a real problem, is getting cotinine from people, so. <laughs> Not a problem in MH Tech, right? It's no. just another project. Yeah. And yeah, the, the students are cheap. We'll get an undergrad to do that. There we go. Semester. All right. Yeah. Anyway, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.